I am a black feminist, and I'm also a classicist. In a nutshell, that means I love studying the languages and histories of the ancient cultures of Egypt, Greece, and Rome. But before I get into the hows and whys of who I am and what I study, I'd like to deconstruct for you Against the Grain, the theme of this year's Hamilton TEDx Talks. And I do it because that's what I do. <laughs> the phrase actually comes from carpentry. It refers to the fact that if someone rubs her hand against the grain of a piece of lumber, she will get splinters. It's now come into clo clo sorry, colloquial language as an idiom referring to eccentric or unusual behavior or acting out or rebelling and suffering negative consequences. So, if I were to start covering Akon's track, Against the Grain, from his 2008 album, Freedom, you would probably think that this grandmotherly professor of classics in Africana studies is going against the grain herself. Heck, even knowing who Akon is, <laughs> is going against the grain. This example is fairly harmless. Most applications of the phrase are negative, and indeed, Akon's is highly negative and problematic from a black feminist standpoint. Akon's persona in the song is going against the grain because, as he says, he fell in love. And the refrain is, I was wrong for falling in love. With female voices singing gender slur, they always say, don't love a hoe. But does going against the grain have to be negative or painful? What if going with the grain is what causes splinters? What if doing what it is expected reinforces and endorses stereotypes, racism, sexism, and other systems of oppression? I hope my story shows that going against the, the grain can be a joyous, exhilarating, and liberating form of resistance. It hasn't always been splinter-free, but I can say I stayed true to me. I just realized that rhymes. <laughs> In my reflections on my location as a black feminist who loves teaching Latin and Greek, I owe much to Audre Lorde, Patricia Williams, and to the pe personal narratives of Fanny Jackson Coppin and Anna Julia Cooper, who were among the first to combine a classical education with black feminism back in the 19th century. I began my love affair with the Latin language when I was 14 and attending high school in a small town on the southern tier of New York. It had been originally suggested that I be placed in the non-regents, that is non-college prep, vocational track with an emphasis on home economics. Now, this was going with the grain. Since I was a girl of African descent, and my grandmother was a cook, a highly regarded cook, but a domestic servant nonetheless. But the problem was, I was a Haley. And the Haley's had lived in Bath, New York, since the early 1800s. And although colored, all of us, girls and boys alike, were smart. I had always done well in school and received good grades. By 14, I already had geometry and algebra at my previous school on the campus of Hampton Institute, the site of the education of many of the women who are the focus of hidden figures. I was very depressed to learn that if placed in this home ec track, I could not take foreign language. My father persuaded, none too gently, <clears throat> the guidance department of the injustice of this plan. And so begrudgingly, I was placed in the regent's track for a probationary period to see if I could handle it. Now I faced the thrilling but still ominous task of choosing a language. The options were French, Latin, and Spanish. 
I quickly eliminated Spanish and French because they were conversational languages and I had just recovered from a childhood stammer and stutter. I took four years of Latin and excelled. I took the Latin achievement exam and I won prizes at the state and national conventions of the Junior Classical League. I continued to take Latin at Syracuse University and I started Greek, never intending to major in it. I wanted to be an elementary school teacher but always feeling the wonder of those languages spoken so long ago. After two weeks in the School of Education at Syracuse, I came back to Latin, and I did, in fact, declare it my major. But at Syracuse, I began to wonder if I were the only African-American person ever to study these languages. There were no other students of color in my classes there, in fact, my peers of color derided my eventual decision to major in Latin. What good are you going to accomplish for black people studying the languages of dead white men? What indeed. So by going against the grain in this way, I was deemed a race traitor. But I was born under the sign of Aries. And so I persisted. I went to the University of Michigan for graduate work and there encountered the isolation and racism which results when there is not a critical mass of people like oneself in the field. However, I persevered. I received my PhD in classics, the first and only African American woman to do so at the University of Michigan. And I, thank you. and I went off to teach. I am often asked why I went into classics and more importantly, why I stay. All I can say is somehow, mystically I suppose, I connected with Latin. Perhaps it was the kindness of my high school Latin teacher. She and I are still Facebook friends. Uh, perhaps it was the orderliness of Latin all those neat paradigms of declensions and conjugations. Um, in a chaotic time in my life, my mother had died when I was 13, puberty had set in, we had moved, and no, 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 no. In any case, I continue to teach classics, and elementary Latin remains my number one favorite course to teach, and for all you Hamilton College students, I'm teaching it in the fall, <laughs> a little plug. What I want to emphasize by giving this personal history is that my training as a, as a classicist has been as traditional and as mainstream as it comes. It really does go with the grain. I can analyze a speech of Cicero or explain the complexities of the Roman family and legal structure or give you a point-by-point -point analysis of Herodotus's ethnography, but... I have the added consciousness of an African-American woman. No matter how much I immerse myself in the ancient societies of Greece and Rome, I can never escape what it means to be a black, cisgendered woman in the United States. That consciousness, combined with an ever-evolving critical race feminist consciousness, has made me uneasy with some things I was taught or rather, with things I was not taught. I used to get great delight out of people's reactions to my field of specialization until I analyzed the intellectual presuppositions behind them. That realization came when I was attending uh, the annual meeting of the American Philological Association, now renamed the Society for Classical Studies. I was talking to an official from the National Endowment for the Humanities. He asked me what I did. This is a conference of classicists. All right. He asked me what I did. I told him, I teach classics at Howard University. His reply, it must be grim teaching classics to black people. It was the only time I have come up with that snappy reply, you know, the one you think of, Hours later, I said, 
not as grim as sitting here talking to you. <laughs> the assumption, of course, is that folks of African descent are incapable of intellectual pursuits, and classics represents the epitome of pure intellectual endeavor. In United States history, this assumption, forthrightly stated by pro-slavery advocates, formed the thesis of arguments against educating Africans in the United States. John C. Calhoun, a senator from South Carolina and vice president, our seventh vice president, serving under John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, was alleged to have said, and I quote, if there can be found a Negro who could conjugate a Greek verb, I would give up my notions of the inferiority of the Negro. Unquote. This same assumption and this very statement were the goads that drove black women especially to succeed in the white academy. Fanny Jackson Coppin and Anna Julia Cooper both cite Calhoun's statement as the impetus to excel at the gentleman's course, as classics was known at Oberlin College, the only institution of higher education open to both men and women of all races at that time. But that was then, and this is now, scores of African American women and men have disproved Calhoun's stereotype and moved on to expand the parameters and definition of knowledge. They have gone against the grain to empower us all. Yet, I persist in classics. Why? Really, there's something wrong with me. But I do it because I am a literal radical. I firmly believe that to de deconstruct the hierarchy of knowledge, you have to be radical. That is, you have to get to the roots of that hierarchy of knowledge. Nevertheless, there are times that I feel like an intellectual schizophrenic. To resolve the resulting tension between who I am, African American woman, what I believe, black critical race feminist theory and thought, and what I love, Latin and Greek, I turn to black feminist thinkers like Patricia Williams, author of The Alchemy of Race and Rights. Early in her introduction, she writes, and I quote, I am a commercial lawyer, as well as a teacher of contract and property law. I am also black and female, a status that one of my former employees described as being, quote, at oxymoronic odds with that of a commercial lawyer. While I certainly took issue with that particular characterization, it is true that my attempts to write in my own voice have placed me in a snarl of social tensions and crossed boundaries, end quote. Talk about going against the grain. Many of my crossed boundaries are limits imposed by stereotypes held by my audience. To European Americans, as a black feminist a academic, I must be in Africana studies or women's studies. If not, I must be in sociology or education. I must be a, cash, a canon basher and view education as an affirmation of my culture, and my culture does not include Eurocentric academic disciplines. Along the same lines, as a classicist, I must be conservative, Eurocentric, and male-centered. My classroom must be apolitical and unconcerned with issues of race and gender. Many of my fellow African Americans view me as an odd fish as well. I must be one of those folks who prefer croissants to cornbread. One who reads Thomas Sewell instead of bell hooks. Surely I am a politically and intellectually uncritical assimilationist. Running through these assumptions is the premise that you are what you teach and you must teach what you are. 
There can be no crossover, no cross boundaries. Crossovers, whether in academic disciplines or popular music or racial categories or sexuality and gender expression are viewed with suspicion and misunderstanding. Black intellectuals have, it seems, always been judged as crossovers. The distrust and suspicion of the community towards black intellectuals is not a new phenomenon. Here are the lyrics to a popular song from the early years of the 20th century. There is a racial slur. Niggas getting more like white folks, more like white folks every day. Niggers learning Greek and Latin. Niggers wearing silk and satin. Niggers getting more like white folks every day. August Wilson, a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright and author of Fences, now a film starring Denzel Washington and Viola Davis, stated, and I quote, the cultural background of my life is black, and that's what I deal with. I'm not grounded in the history of Western civilization. I know the names like Euripides and Aristophanes, but I haven't read all that stuff. And what if you are grounded in Western civilization? Does that make me less black, less woman? My location as a black woman in a traditional humanities discipline, the marginalized of the marginalized, has led me to research how my foremothers handled the oxymoronic odds cited by Williams. Many of the women I have studied from the 19th century were de facto classically educated. They seem to have reconciled any conflicts they felt by using their classical education as a fulcrum for social change. Throughout their lives, they continued to go against the grain to improve the lives of others. I have come to realize that I, like other black women, go against the grain simply because I exist and survive. And in the words of Audre Lorde, we were never meant to survive. I also have come to realize that I, like other black women, speak in tongues, to borrow May Gwendolyn Henderson's words. So yes, as a black feminist classicist, I go against the grain proudly and encourage all of you to do the same, no matter what your individual tensions and pressures are. Aim for, borrowing once again from Henderson, quote, a unity of understanding within the dialects of your identity. Thank you. <laughs>